experience. All right. Firstly, let's start off with the first myth. Let's raise hands. How many men are in the room? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, eight. Can you hear me? All right. You can't hear me, huh? Okay, so I'll speak loudly. So there's nine men in the room. Okay, 10, 11, including me and John, out of 60. So that's the first myth. Ladies first. That's a lie. Men first. We die first. Think about that. Ladies first is, should, is no longer appropriate. Men first. And why do men die first? Because they want to. Because they want to. That's <laughs> 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 not a joke. But seriously. So and the reason is, again, the women are much more flexible than men. And one of the things about aging, a big piece of aging is flexibility. And when we say flexibility, I'm not just saying flexibility, you know, touch your feet. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about flexibility of the mind as well. And that has a huge impact on the duration and quality of life. So the feminine mind is far more flexible, right? Right. Sure, you're, you're crazy, but you're flexible, <laughs> right? So no one gets a free ride. And so, so and the, the masculine mind is a lot more linear, for, for real. The feminine mind has a lot more receptivity, is a lot more lateral, is a lot more, let's say, open. And that's a tremendous advantage and, of course, the source of your suffering. No one gets a free ride. No, it is the truth. And then the masculine mind is a much more linear mind. There isn't as much what they call turbidity, internal dialogue, and excessive internal thinking. There is, but not as much. That's their advantage, but that's also what kills them. So you think about this, because when we go through, here's the trick. Everyone grows old, but very few of us grow up. And so that's the big difference. And just because you've grown old doesn't mean you've grown up. And so the one of the, the, the tricks in aging is to grow until you die. And it sounds like a little metaphysical saying, but they've proven it. Now, the men in the, the room here, you are exceptions. You're actually here. So you don't represent the average masculine mind because you're actually here and you're not dead. So, you know, so you've got a few things going for you. And so the, the, the very fact that you're willing to sit here and listen means that, oh, guess what? There's some receptivity there. So we have to really kind of seize on that is one of the foundation secrets in aging gracefully. You know, because a couple of myths of aging is, you know, I'm going to get old and I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to get old and I'm going to have a limited mobility. I'm going to get old and I'm going to have a limited amount of joy in my life. I'm going to get old and I'm going to spend 20 years dying in $270,000 in copay, and which is actually, no, that, those are statistics, you know, and so that's kind of what we think. Now, we're dealing with a generation here that's kind of uh, evolving out of a uh, preconceived paradigm of living, dying, death. Right? And that's really great news. So let's look at this symbol. Does anyone recognize this symbol? Yes. Right? And those of you that were in the Korean War probably saw this symbol. Right? Does that look familiar? Or no? On the flag. Yeah, the flag. So the Korean, the North Korean, or South Korean flag. But anyways, uh, so this is the yin yang symbol. This yin yang symbol represents many, 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 many things. But today we're going to look at it as it relates to aging and quality of life. So we're going to say that this yin yang symbol is actually you. You see? <laughs> you? It's you. And then this is the black side, and this is. 
So this represents the masculine and feminine aspects of a human being. When we are born, for the first eight years of life, no gender. You're just a little dude, right? No gender. And so then we establish ego, and in order to perpetuate the species, then the polarity must show up. I'm a manly man, you're a girly girl, then the opposites attract, and we make more. And that's just God's evil trick, and that's how it works. Okay? Yeah, and then when we get to about 58, believe it or not, there's these phases in life. The first eight years, we establish ego. Then you go through 25 years of the development of what they call the uh, flowering of your potential. So that's the, the age 33. And that's when you were flowering. Oh, look at me. I'm so beautiful. I'm so powerful. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a plumber. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be an architect. Okay, you flower. In the beginning, it's like a, your life is nothing but a year of seasons, the seasons of your life. The beginning of your life is the springtime. It's the sprouting, right? The color is green. And if you look at a sprout, it's really, really, really flexible. Like when you start pruning, you can see, oh, look at all the little green sprouts coming off the branches. These are brand new little you know, saplings. Oh, nice. And then the old ones that didn't make it, they're brittle and they fall off the tree. Right? So the trick is can I hang on to the number one thing? Flexibility. Flexibility physically and mentally and emotionally. It's very difficult. But can you? And if you do so, you can become what we call a Taoist immortal. I know you're all dying to become one of those. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you will live every day until you die. It's not how long you live. It's how well you live. Because I remember when I first started teaching senior citizens and I talked about extending life. They looked at me in horror. It's like, oh, God, another 20 years of not being able to evacuate my bowels and paying taxes. And it's like nothing sexy about it, right? Because who wants more time if you're in a prison, right? So we don't want time. Time is not necessarily the most valuable asset. What's the most valuable asset is quality time. When we're mentally alert, we're physically capable, and we're emotionally, you know, having an open, receptive experience. So when they start talking about longevity and they start talking about extending life, we got to really realize that it's not necessarily about living to be 108. You can live to 33. As long as you lived every day, then that was a life well spent. And that's a real key piece here when we start looking at becoming flexible in some of our definitions and also looking at how important it is to be receptive. So let's go back to this yin-yang symbol and seasons of life. So we went through the sprouting age. We went through our flowering age, which is referred to as the early summer of your life, right? When all the, you can see all the blossoms and everything, right? Then we go through what we call the fruition of our life, which is 33, another 25 year block to 58. That's called the early, you know, midsummer. That's the I'm hard, you know, this is it. I've got my garden, I planted my seeds, they flowered, and look at all my melons. So now you're successful, you have your, your children, your home, you already went through college, you are what you are, in most cases, by 58. Then from 58 to 83 is considered the fall, metal, okay, a harvest of your life. In theory, if you work the garden well, that's supposed to be the most powerful time of your life. It's supposed to be when you're really, really in your power, you have all the experience, all the resources, and hopefully a strong mind and body in which you can enjoy this harvest. From 83 to 108, 25 year block, is what they call water or winter or transformational period. And that's when you're preparing for your future. And you know what that is? Death and all of eternity. I've got that going for you. The idea is during that period of life is to reach a state of tranquility where there is no internal conflict, there's no ex excessive internal dialogue, and we're in a state where we actually have a pretty good idea of who's living in your head. Okay, that's an interesting piece. And that's supposed to be like what your life is about, is basically establishing a relationship with this momentary, momentarily residing consciousness. So there's the body, we know you're not, you're not your body, right? You're experiencing having a body. I think therefore I am. We know that's a lie because there's something that knows you're thinking. So there must be a consciousness that's aware of I think. 
So then you're not your thoughts. What are you? Your consciousness momentarily residing in rotting flesh. That would be you and me. Okay, and we got to look at it that way because then it keeps us in, in touch with this thing called impermanence. Okay, so we got to kind of set this uh, groundwork here. So we talk about being flexible and basically embracing impermanence. When we're not flexible, we are the opposite. We're rigid. And when we're rigid, this is when my suffering begins personally, is when I start to attach. I start to judge and I start to resist. So I, I, I resist what is and I judge it as good or bad and I attach to what was. And what does that do? It triggers cortisol. And that's a stress hormone. And this whole game is about chemicals. So the thoughts in your head are going to determine whether you're going to trigger a yin or yang chemical. Okay? So one chemical is all about destroying the body, and that's cortisol. It's basically breaking down cells. Another chemical, like dopamine, is building the body. Go back to the seasons. Up until about 33, the dopamine and what they call the remodeling and the building chemicals are free. Right? I used to get up in the morning at 33 and before that, and literally I was able to jump up and kick these ceiling tiles and do all my cool stuff and down into the splits and, you know, run up the hill and get in a fist fight at 9 a.m. at the center. That's what I did. Three years. I taught martial arts. I taught the military. I taught law enforcement. I was the most interesting man in the world, and it was great, you know, and no matter what, you could stay up all night training, sword fighting, get up at 5 a.m. and do it again. And it was beautiful, and the energy was free. Then what happens is this drip of, okay, remodeling chemicals and then thus demolition chemicals. Because I can't remodel the kitchen unless I smash the kitchen down, right? Has anybody remodeled any of their home? It's, a, it's really stressful. The first thing you do is destroy your kitchen, you know, and then you have to go in and build a new one. So your body is constantly going through this stage of breaking down old cells, right? and basically building new ones. But again, after about 58 especially, but it starts at 33, there's more breaking down than building. See, the way it went is you got like two breakdown and five building. Two breakdown, now I'm growing. Now two breakdown and four building. Two breakdown, three building. Two breakdown, two building. Two breakdown, one building. <laughs> And the only way we can trigger the release of these, let's say, remodeling hormones is what they call strategic stress. All right? So anytime you've ever lifted weights or went on a long hike, you're like, oh, my, my thighs are killing me. Well, that all that broke down. There's a leftover lactic like, acid in the body. And it's like, oh, my. And now, but the whole body is on high alert saying, guess what? We better rebuild that muscle mass. Every cell in your body gets cascaded by these remodeling hormones, even though they're your primary focus was on your glutes. So you have to actively push the button to get the remodeling hormones because they're no longer free. That right there is a big piece that we forget. See, up until that, it's free. After, like especially after 58, you have to break the body down for three hours a day for the rest of your life. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I remember I told my brother that and threw a fit. Well, God damn it, I worked my whole life. Now you're saying I gotta work out three hours a day. Don't, don't. And you'll be miserable 24 hours a day. You'll be hoping for a bowel movement. Your back is gonna be killing you. You're gonna be bloated. So either way, you, you, it's true, it's a funny thing. You know, and so it's like, okay, and dude, does that mean you need to be do burpees three hours a day? No. What that does mean is you need to have a low grade aerobic, where you're just kind of walking, you can talk to someone, a higher grade aerobic, where you're moving and you cannot have a conversation, and then an anaerobic, where you're actually building muscle mass every day. That is your diet. Pardon me? You didn't, you didn't like that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and so, but you, 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 that is it. And you think it isn't, but it is. But the problem is, we don't live in a lifestyle anymore that allows us to do that naturally and comfortably, so you've got to go work out or go do something. So what we try to do is through the use of Qigong and Tai Chi is show you how you can 
you know, stimulate the low and high grade aerobic and anaerobic naturally throughout the day. And by the end of the day, you've done three hours without saying, okay, I'm punching in, here's my three hours. When you come here, and it's hard for people, it's really hard. So when you come here, we're not just working you out, we're trying to teach you and trying to seed a healthy habit so that throughout the day, you do 10 minutes of this, 10 minutes of that. Has anybody ever learned how to use an instrument? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there you go, French horn. Now, if I wanted to get good at the French horn, I could go to my French horn class twice a week and play for an hour. Okay. Or I can do that, but I can leave the French horn on my kitchen table. And while I'm waiting for the eggs to boil, or when I'm waiting for this or that, I do, I run some scales. You're always training. I like my guitar. It's on my kitchen table. So when I'm waiting, I'll run a scale. I don't just, all right, it's guitar time. You know, if I'm at the airport, I'm training. I'm, I'm mixing, I'm standing, and I'm doing uh, standing on a boat. I stand with my knees bent. I regulate my breath. I'm always training. I can't just sit there and wait. I'm feeling like time is valuable. I'm not going to wait. Why wait? If I'm waiting, I'm waiting for time to end. That means, okay, when I get out of this line, time's going to be fun. Well, then what happened to this? So now I'm in resistance. So how do I take now, drop into now, and love now? By training. What do I mean by training? Well, first thing I'll do is I'll breathe. I'll regulate my breath. I'll inhale for eight seconds. I'll exhale for eight seconds, which will regulate my emotional state. I will mix the, the, the lymphatic system, which we'll go into in a little bit, and circulate the blood by transferring my weight forward and backwards. There's a million things I can do, even though I'm just standing there waiting in line at the bank. <laughs> so I'm not waiting. I'm being. We're not human waitings. We're human beings. So do you need to really take the three hours and time block them? No. Nope. You just need to make it a habit. We all need to make it a habit to constantly go in and work these key systems that we'll talk about. But the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was the concept of being flexible and how as we age, we go through these different phases of being a very macho man, right, and a very sexy woman. And then we find the middle. At a certain point, even chemically, you're no more masculine or feminine. You're the same. Before and after death, you're the same. So the work for the man is to become flexible. The work for the feminine is actually to become more linear. The, you know, they have all these workshops on, you know, cultivating the sacred feminine. You sit there with a, you know, a little sage pot and a, okay, and that's great. And you know what? I've been to them. I've done everything, you know. It's awkward, you know. You ever been to a sweat lodge or standing there naked with a bunch of middle-aged women? It's like, okay, I'm touch, touch the feminine, I guess. And so, hey, got to be flexible. And so I, I try, you know. So you, the goal is a journey into the receptive, flexible, feminine. That's for the masculine. The feminine's work is to go into the linear, straight, clear, masculine. So actually you wind up right in the middle. The same way you came in is how you go out. If you hang on to either, it expedites, you know, the, the pace in which you leave. So flexibility is a big one, real big, mentally, physically, and emotionally. In the act of promoting this flexibility, we trigger a chemical reaction that rewards you with dopamine and remodeling chemicals. To move the body, and they've done the research, Physical exercise has more impact on the emotional state than antidepressant drugs, with no contraindications. Okay, so they've done this, a lot of research where they're really realizing, wow, the human being is an amazing machine, it's just no one has the owner's manual. So we don't know. So a big piece about living every day until you die and enjoying the quality of life until you die is having a basic understanding of human anatomy and physiology, energetic anatomy and physiology, and knowing. If I tell the average person, you know, put your hand on your spleen, put your hand on your liver, how many vertebrae do you have? No one knows. Put your hand on your liver. They put their hand on your spleen, right? I, I know, it's here. But a lot of people don't know. But you know exactly what's in your portfolio, right? You know all about your car. You got a maintenance system for your car, but not yourself. So the priority is you keep that which you cherish. If you want a healthy body, you want a healthy mind, you've got to cherish a healthy body and a healthy mind. And it has to become your priority. 
it's your number one possession is a strong mind and body. So let's go back to this concept of yin yang mind, basically becoming flexible and becoming linear, fine. Realizing the importance of triggering these chemicals daily. All right. So I started this when I was, I don't know, 1975, long time ago. Okay, I'm in my 50s now. So, okay, I was really fortunate to be trained by what I considered unbelievably old people. Okay, because I first started just martial, and they were, I'm talking 70, 80, 90. These are old people. To me, when you're 14, 12, you know, and I just really wanted to learn boxing. All right, my name is Michael Leone. Yeah. So Italian American boxing, Golden Gloves. Everybody in my family—that's what you do. You go to the gym. You're not a man unless you have those gloves on the back of your white satin jacket. Remember those days? Yeah. It was a bad look. And so, <laughs> but that's what we did. And so I really enjoyed yeah. boxing. And then I saw, oh, you know what? I'm a good boxer. And so are my buddies. And one day, all my buddies got beat up by some old guy who kicked him in the head. I'm like, what the hell? I'm a boxer. This old guy kicked my buddy because they were disrespectful we were in the city and we're just dumb children and we deserve the beating so I'm like so he did this to you this guy's got the broken jaw this guy's so what did I do I found the old guy he says what the what did you do and so that's when I began learning like karate and taekwondo so I'm learning all the martial arts and this is amazing stuff and okay I'm like well there's a thing called ki and chi and it's very mystical so I keep looking and I find there's the Dong Han Taoist clan that's these guys in this poster here big long silly robes and top knots and Korean Taoists, right? And this gentleman was a veteran, a Korean, South Korean, a rock marine major, okay? So anybody that's dealt with any of these guys knows they're not nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they're just not nice, you know? And he was my dad's age at the time. So again, I figured he was just some old dude. And I wasn't overly impressed. So the first thing I tried to do was kick him. <laughs> you know, like, why not kick the old guy? See if he can do what he's saying he can do. So he broke my foot <laughs> and oh. knocked me out. So he just blocked it, just hit my gut, and I hit the ground. So then I was like, oh my, very humble. This is amazing. It's ruining my definition of what old dudes can do, right? And so I started to realize, oh, being tough isn't necessarily being tough. Being tough is being strong, being having discipline, being able to stand like this for 30 minutes and do all this stuff. So I was really fortunate to get this upgrade and then also see, oh, there's a bunch of them. Oh my, there's a whole lineage, which most of them were women, believe it or not. So, so now you have all these little old ladies that can throw you across the room <laughs> with a smile, you know, <laughs> and then and then hit points and bring you back. It's like, wow, they're like mystical little gnomes. And it's like, how is this possible? So it was not the Italian American upbringing that I saw. Because in my family, everybody at 50 was working on their second heart attack. You know what I mean? And and they're morbidly obese with a cigar in their mouth driving an Eldorado. And I'm, and I'm looking at, right, you know the guy. And so it's Tony Soprano, and that's your uncle. And so I'm looking at a lot of suffering, right? Constant suffering, because it's just turbidity. You know what I mean? High core turbidity. Oh, constant physical problems. Just like, so this is the future. I'm going to work, I get a crappy little brick house in the suburbs of Chicago and drive in Eldorado and rot. <laughs> and so it wasn't, it didn't resonate. It made me feel very uncomfortable. And so I'm now looking at these, you know, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, Orientals in pajamas. And he had a much more derogatory, you know, you're again looking at a Korean war vet who didn't have the greatest, you know, oh, cooks in pajamas, god damn it, son, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I was supposed to be a Chicago cop, not standing around in a row. And so it was really a big problem. And so I'm like, yeah, but you know what? I don't want to do that. All my uncles, my grandparents, they're all cops. None of them saw 70, you know, and this doesn't look fun. So maybe I can do something else. I'm going to try this. So I decided, and I went into the ashram, and I lived with the teacher, and I made it my life. And I opened my first center at 21, and this is all I've done. And I've studied, I've been wow. to Asia, I've done all the stuff, and really made it. And back then, you got to first learn warrior, you know, fighting, be strong, push-ups, and, and then scholar, because what they would teach you is, you know, uh, 
Okay, someone grabs you by the wrist. What are you going to do? There's 57 things. But the first thing you do is you hit this point. Oh, his hand opens. And then you hit this point under his arm. Oh, his heart stops. And then you, it's like all these cool points. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm doing it all. And so, and we had little dummies with the points on them. You get really good. It's called Dim Muck. And you hit all these points. Yeah. But what he did is he taught me acupuncture. And he taught me which organs. He taught me Fujian organ. He taught me yin yang theory. He taught me all this, the right stuff, as he would say, for the wrong reason. Because he knew he's not going to sit here and get me to study this chart, 368 points. I'm not going to do it. But if he shows me that this one will knock someone out, I'll remember it. So by the time I got to 21, I was ready for scholarly training, which was traditional Chinese medicine. And so you learn all the medicine and all the stuff. Then you start the next phase, sage, which is basically the philosophy and meditation. So it has to be warrior, scholar, sage. You need to learn all of these pieces as you go through this process. Simultaneously, I'm around all these masters and grandmasters that are ancient as far as I'm concerned. And they stand like a mountain and they move like a river. So I was like, okay, you know, now they're starting, you know, they started to pass away at like 92 and 102. My grandmaster right now is probably 86, right? And I still wouldn't mess with him. You know, if he was here, he probably looks like he's 50. He still has his flat top and you know he, and he's got a bad attitude and i mean but god bless him he's 83 years old you know and so so it's like okay that's an interesting model that's interesting how did you how can you do that so we go into understanding some really basic principles number one priorities first priority you already know this you're here you're very successful if you're in this room you're the top 10 percent of society you probably know that you're smart enough to get here. Okay. Most people aren't. So priorities. At a certain point, there's a certain level of self-respect and self-love that must have been there for you to get this far in life. Most people don't have that. They're not here. Okay. Self-respect, self-love. Uh, guess what? You're not your possessions. They serve you. So I had to go four years of owning nothing. All I had was a silly robe. And it wasn't even allowed to call it my robe. It was the robe I wore. And it was to break the Western addiction to form and constantly putting material in front of your body. So uh, a clear mind and a healthy body is way more important than things. So guess what? You want to live in the ashram? You come tomorrow, you bring nothing. That's right. Put my motorcycle, my car. Good. Give it away. See you later. You won't need it where you're going. So then that get rid of most of the people that wanted to go. It was me and one other guy after that. You know, it's like, really? So, okay, <laughs> because you gotta really believe it then. You gotta be a believer. And so, okay, so I see that, I go through that. I'm currently, I have a whole generation of friends that are living and going through, and that's when the new convertible Mustangs came out, and CD players just came out, and I had none of them. I was, again, eating kimchi, sleeping on the floor. Okay, <laughs> kimchi is horrible. <laughs> now I like it. But, uh, so, but then I watched what happened. You know, I'm past 50 now. All my buddies, they're blown out. Most of us, most of my, all of them are just blown out. They've already destroyed themselves. They're already biologically 60, 65. Do you know that the average person is biologically older than they are chronologically? So if you're 60, you're 67. If we did a biological age test. Yeah, that's right. Do you know, and here's some of the myths. The human body is designed to operate at the age of 45 to 50 until death, biologically. When these masters <coughs> die, part of the lineage is autopsy and to determine biological age upon death. And the ones that I know that did die, they died. They taught Tai Chi. They went upstairs. At the end of the day, took the clothes off, sat in Zazan, and left. Interesting. So it's like, okay, it was a hell of a lesson. <laughs> and now he's gone, really? But he was here yesterday and he had an attitude. I know, but he was dumb. He just didn't tell you. Okay, that's cool. So interesting. Again, you're looking at a young boy that's getting his definition of living, aging, and dying just ripped out. You know, it's like, huh, so I don't have to go down this path. There is a way you can go through life and live every day and then die. Beautiful. And there's a whole culture of people that I'm around that are doing it, and they've been doing it. This, this lineage is 6,200 years old. So there are documents and all of that stuff. 
So it's like, okay, it's not a new idea. I'm not jumping into a trend here. This is, you know, they've got plenty of years of social evidence, people living and dying. So let's give this a try. So biological age, and it's like, okay, these guys upon autopsy were about 50. Well, how can you tell? Size of your heart, the size of your internal organs, okay? Uh, visceral fat around the organs, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. There's all these indications that'll tell you how old your body is biologically upon death. They can look at this, or when you're alive, which is a lot more fun, they can look at, you know, oxygen intake, range of motion, coordination, all of these things. The human body was designed to stay 45 to 50 until death. Why is that? We wouldn't have made it. You would not be allowed uh, to go to Safeway with a little rascal driving around. You're picking berries. And if you're not fast, you're eaten by a lion. It's that simple. So the human body did not have the luxury of sitting in a recliner chair or driving to work. So you had to work physically or die. That was it. Makes sense. And so the human body, you know, actually does have the ability to develop and maintain a certain range of motion and quality of life until death. Okay. Now, what's going on with like even Western science to support all of this? They're doing all kinds of research now uh, with biological age testing because they're realizing that's the key. If we can change people's biological age, then we could lessen their dependencies on their medical entitlements. That's what's going on right now. So there's a big push. And as we get older, there'll be a penalty. If you're 50 and you're in a 57-year-old body, there's a penalty. If your body mass is incorrect, there's a penalty because you're now an enemy of the state. I mean, I'm serious. That, that, you think I'm kidding. That's where we're going. We're looking at the last generation that retires and gets Social Security and gets Medicaid. It's over. That's all gone. And so now it's like, oh, by the way, keep moving. There's a jump rope. This is for you. And that's it. Here's even more bad news. Life expectancy. We have these different life expectancies. What is the life expectancy right now for a man? Does anyone know? 64 and a half. 64 and a half. 64 and a half. 79. 78. It's 78. A woman? 82 to 83. Okay? And that's radically changing, though. That's changing. So to be a millennium, to live 100 years, is no longer impressive. Okay? And they're expecting what they're saying, the new 50 is 80. Yeah. Oh, I'm like, really? Because I always research all this stuff because it's fun for me to look at my client base. So it's like, okay. So the new 50 is 80. How do you say it? Well, let's look at it now. Look at you guys. You're actually here learning. You're actually active. You probably do stuff. You golf, you move, you do Tai Chi. Back then, at 55, What'd you do? Get three more years and you drop dead? That was it. They expected you to die three years after retirement. To their horror, you're still here. Okay? But that wasn't, it wasn't the plan. But no, it's very true. And so, so what's going on is the biological age is starting to go longer and longer and longer, which is really great news. And they're starting to see, okay, what's happening? Well, of course, volume and quality of food and lifestyle and the general public's education. We know a little bit more about the body, especially the women, because they're far more receptive. So they're living longer and they're living better, and their abilities are going. Now, they uh, realize that exercise, what they say, exercise, meditation, and diet, and sleep are the biggest uh, uh, biological age reversers. If you want to reverse biological age, it's regular exercise, but it's got to, it can't be a Harvard. They, if you can research like Mayo and Harvard, they're all over this right now. They're very concerned with this. So Harvard did a study and they're saying specifically Tai Chi is really, really good. Yoga, really, really good. You know, things like that. You know, of course, walking and swimming and hiking. Uh, weightlifting, hardcore, high impact, not so much. After 33, sometimes you'll do more damage than good. You can do some free weights because we've got to maintain muscle mass, but isometrics would be safer so we don't rip anything off of bones. So they're realizing bone density, uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis, reversible. We do it here all the time. 
you know, we do a DEXA bone scan before and after. Has anyone had any experience with bone density here with us? Yeah, any reverse, we'll so, take yeah. the test. Yeah, and how, and how are you doing? I was I was in the armor general back at 62 that said his first bone density. It said I had the bone density of 85 year old woman. I, I now though after going to work on that, my bone density is below my chronological age now. You see, that's what can be done. You see it? So reversing bio, I mean, and that's basically Wolf's law. We already know. Well, bone density is a byproduct of supply and demand. And if you if you sit and you atrophy you basically turn to chalk and then you fall and you shatter and you die in the hospital that's basically it now if you use by putting basically a uh, 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 weight-bearing exercise on the bones and vibrating the bones you basically trigger osteoblast and osteoclast and lay down new bone it is that simple so a lot of the work we do we have specific protocols specifically for bone density okay because that's a big one so reversing bone density, there's a whole panel of things we can do to start, all right, what's your biological age? Now let's reverse it. The last time I did a biological age test, I was 28, biologically. And so so that's, you know, because it's all, how flexible, how strong, what can you do, what's your range? I'll, you know what an easy one is? Get off the floor. Like yeah. look at these people, they're sitting on the floor. God bless them. But they train and stuff. But the cheer is the death of Western civilization. When I lived in the silly little ashram, no chair. You sat on the floor. You slept on the floor. No chair. The chair kills the person. So it's like, okay, how old are you? Oh, okay, sit down. What do you mean sit down? And they're doing this now in a medical office. Have a seat. Well, where? Right there. Now, are you this guy? All right, wait a second. Wait, all right, I got it. I got it. This is me. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, that looks good. Now get up. Hold up. Okay, I'm rolling. I'm rolling now. Here we go. Oh, no. Oh. Right? Yeah. And so it's like, no. They want you to sit, no hands, and stand. Or nothing. Now, they don't do it like that, but the idea is if you need your hands, if you need your elbows, if you need your knees, they all take off a decade as far as life expectancy. And so just getting off the ground will show you. <clears throat> Your mobility <clears throat> is a big one. So can we reverse that? Of course we can. The body is an amazing thing. And again, training thousands and thousands of people above 50 and seeing the years of abuse reversed. Like you can abuse it. It's like a tree, a little ficus tree that you never watered. You left it in the office. But if you just give it a few ounces of water, it just blossoms. <clears throat> so the body is very forgiving. That's an interesting piece. And you can reverse a lot of stuff that seems like, oh, I'm going to be like this forever. It takes longer because your system isn't working as quickly as it used to, but you can reverse a lot of these, let's say, conditions, you know, whatever your individual condition is that's making you suffer. That's, again, a myth. But the trick is you have to stay in your body. You have to maintain a healthy relationship with your body, and that forces you then to dump these remodeling hormones to build the body and also affect the mind. Really key piece. You have to keep moving. Really, really sounds simple, but it's a little more sophisticated than that as far as the type of movement and what we're doing. All right, let's talk about some of the systems and movement. Sitting for two hours is as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes. Did you know that? No. Yeah, there's new research. Why is that? Sedentary. Yeah, okay, sedentary. Why is that? Nothing's moving. Nothing's moving, right? So what does that mean? Okay, so let's talk about, this is a big secret. It's new. It's not really, but we don't know much about it in Western science. But a big myth, okay? Your body has two primary fluids. Do you know what they are? Those of you that heard me, don't, don't. I got a lot of students that know all this stuff. Don't ruin my fun. Make me seem smart, please. Water. Water. Lymph. Blood and lymph. That's correct. Blood and lymphatic fluid. Water. Okay. What's the percentage? How much percentage of your body is blood and what percentage is lymphatic fluid? 
70 percent lymph yeah isn't that strange you think you're just blood you know I, I did at least and then i was like really that's weird okay what the hell is lymphatic fluid it's in your mouth right now your saliva or it's in your throat any moisture okay what is lymphatic what does the lymph system do takes out the trash the lymph nodes fight infection so think about this lymphatic system you have something like a few trillion cells in the body and every cell right demands fuel oxygen and food right and nutrients if you will and then what happens to the food it's expelled as waste where does the waste go in your lymph system so your lymph is your sewer system for all your cellular waste but if you here's the problem with the lymphatic system as opposed to the heart circulatory system that heart pumps it's passively doing its thing the lymph system doesn't work as you're sitting there right now it's all pulling in your feet below your knees that's why we get gout and edema and all of these things because you basically have rotting fluid in your body it's true and so by moving by moving the body everything comes up and then there's a subclavicle notes here that the lymph fluid goes through and it basically hydrates the body after it's been processed that which is you know let's say turbid is removed through the uh, kidney bladders right make sense so but you don't move you just have this it's like not it's like having a pool in your backyard and we have the big haboob come through dust storm and you have no filter it just sits in the pool what happens to your pool if you don't turn the filter on? it's the same thing it becomes toxic septic that's <coughs> us one of the biggest things that causes our suffering is this excess cellular waste in our lymphatic system now cellular waste in the lymphatic system is measured as acid okay so we all suffer chronic acidosis okay the number one requirement for cancer acid cancer cannot live in a ph balanced system so if you have a good balance of alkaline there's no food but we live in these unbelievably uh, a putrid acidic we're basically filled with putrid fluid cellular waste 70 percent of the cellular waste in your body is removed from your lungs do you know that so when you go like this on a mirror and you see the mist that's waste it's cellular waste so one of the most important things is to move and breathe. So that's the first thing we teach you is how to use your full lung capacity. The average human being uses 30% of the lung capacity. So the first thing we need to do is say, oh, guess what? We need to use a lower abdominal breathing so we can use the whole lung. Concurrently, we know all the lymph, all the lymph, all the lymph, all the lymph has to get basically squeezed, palpated like a sponge so that it goes through the lymph note itself and then you're talking about getting rid of the different poison right clearing the system but if that system isn't stimulated then it doesn't happen so the simple act and here's a problem with the lymphatic system if you move too fast it turns off if you don't move it doesn't turn on because it's maintenance so God's all, look, you're being chased by a lion right now. Let's stop doing maintenance. So once you start really going, it turns off. So it's got to be smooth like gathering berries. And that's why Tai G, 60 beats per minute. Smooth, regulated breath, regulated motion, using all the weight, holding all the weight in the lower body. Everything's moving. Well, what I'm really doing is turning on the pump and removing cellular waste. That simple act of lengthening and strengthening and regulating breath moving the body about 60 beats per minute upper and lower body moving simultaneously right in opposite directions has a profound impact on biological age it's it's really that simple but we don't realize or appreciate how important it is to remove cellular waste and via the lymphatic system via regulated breath in motion that right there the bone density piece <coughs> that's why we do little silly things like this and <clears throat> the lymphatic piece would have a huge impact on the quality of your life you'd feel it in three months 
which is a problem with this modality. It's not a pill. Oh, here's a pill. Feel better. And so we were kind of lulled into uh, thinking someone can remove our suffering with a pill. And they can't. So, and it's not nearly as fast. I can cheat, though, and use acupuncture to remove the symptom. So it's like, oh, but the sciatic is killing me. Oh, I can use the gallbladder points, and I can stick a big needle in there, and then, wow, that feels good. Yeah, but I didn't fix it. You know, I, you have to actually open it, strengthen it, readjust it, move it, and that takes at least three months. It takes 24 months to do the remodel project. If you're like, look, this old house needs remodeling, count on at minimum 24 months to restore the body. And we go through the whole process. From stabilizing, so you can stand like a mountain, to coordination, so you can move like a river, to lengthening and strengthening breath, so that you can remove cellular waste. That's like a whole thing that is not random. It's an old system that we, we take you through. Real key piece. Let's talk about one more key piece. And we'll talk again about cellular waste, but we'll also talk about poison and how we poison ourselves with our thoughts and how every thought triggers the release of these stress hormones that affect every cell in the body and how imperative it is to have a modality in which you can turn the thunderstorm off in your head. You don't use your mind. Your mind uses you because you don't know where the off button is. And if we think about it, internal dialogue is a complete waste of energy, but we're dominated by it. You know, if I can stay riveting and funny enough, I might keep your attention, but usually not. So you go one of three places. You go into the past with your, your mind and your story, and every time you think about the past, it's sad. Even good memories are sad memories. The past belongs to sorrow. That's dumping another form of poison. All right, let's think about the future. Now someone else is thinking about tomorrow. What is that dump? Adrenaline. Anxiety. The future creates anxiety. The past creates lament and sorrow. And now, resistance. Because this is, I'm here now, but when we get out of here, I'm going to go get some coffee and have breakfast. You know, so it's going to be better now. It's not good now. Now it's not good. Later is good. Or the good old days were awesome, but now not so much. So the, the real trick is the only way we can go into the now and get rid of all of this <clears throat> is through silencing the mind. To get rid of what they call imputations and false thoughts. Internal dialogue. There's no need for it. <clears throat> you know you're only supposed to use your mind from about 7 a.m. to maybe 11? 7 in the morning to about 11, right? Is that when the spleen ends, right? Stomach spleen? Yeah. Yeah. What the hell? Okay. We're really designed to just kind of be. Do you ever see a dog? I have a pig. I got a pig. He's the cutest. And he's just his little chubby dude. And he's just ask the pig if he can speak, what time is it is? And he'd say now. Nah. Or dinner time. But yeah. So they don't have any of this. They rest in now. They're God's creatures and they're innocent. Now, if they live with a human being like a little poodle, they turn crazy like you. <laughs> but we, we, by the way, in case you're wondering, we, we destroy the creatures. But uh, they're supposed to be in a state of total bliss and now. When there's now, there's dopamine, the joy of now. You know, I have a little baby, and I, you know, walk, and I watch him, you know, because he's still innocent. And we're walking. I live up in the mountains. And he'll just look around and go, ah, and just enjoy it. And it's like, wow, look at him dig this. Yeah, rock, rock, daddy, rock. And it's like, awesome. Because he hasn't paid taxes yet, and he hasn't gone through all this. Right? There's an innocence there that has not been violated. So we talk about flexibility and returning to innocence. Do you ever hear of a dude called Lao Tzu? Mm -hmm. That's an old child. So you want the wisdom of the elders, but the innocence and flexibility of a baby. Right? My baby will sit there like this for hours and play. Can you sit there like that with him? That's can you return? And that's a big piece. So learning how to turn off internal dialogue, and stop the incessant cascade of poison is as simple as learning how to find your breath. As soon as you focus on your breath, your mind stops. Okay. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, a neurological disease, all these things. Everyone's worried about it. Well, the brain itself swells. 
during the day. Do you know the thing, a, a, a beta wave, alpha wave, like gamma wave, theta wave, you know? The speed in which the brain moves, they can measure. They even sell apps now. You can put it on and it'll tell you, you know, for meditation, because you want to drop down into alpha, you know? Okay, so we spend most of our time in beta or alpha, way up here. And the mind is going, whoa, you're in a state like this, wait. You manage, you know, the Cadillac dealership. So you spend 30 years like this. As your mind is moving quickly, right, it heats up. It literally heats up. What happens to tires when they heat up? They expand. So now you have this brain that's literally expanded in your skull for decades. You go to bed, it's supposed to reduce by 10% in size. It doesn't because you're all... You can't even drop into a good state. So at night, what is it? Cerebral spinal fluid, right? It's supposed to come up and bathe the brain and wash away beta alamoid, basically plaque. It doesn't. It's just this big cotton ball stuffed in your head for decades on fire. And of course it's going to dry out. Of course it's going to have all kinds of issues because you never, ever turned it off. So by learning how to drop it into alpha, Theta is nice. That's when the body starts to rewire itself. It decreases in size and it's bathed. One of the biggest things in premature aging is the fact that that brain has always been in a high, high, high speed. You've always been redlining it on the tachometer. So by learning how to breathe and move, you basically turn off your internal dialogue. By moving the body 60 beats per minute, specifically, you basically drop the speed in which your mind is moving. Do you know that if you want to sleep, here's a secret. You know, if you take like a sleep medicine, like the butterfly of death, Lunesta, <laughs> take the pill, wake up dead. It works. You know, it's like, we'll put you to sleep. So, <laughs> so yeah, really? yeah, yeah, we got you. You know, so that's the worst thing in the world you can do for yourself. But... How do you go to sleep if you can't sleep? Stop talking. What? In your mind, as soon as your mind has one word, a sentence, you bump up the alpha waves. What drops the brain into the, or pardon me, bump up the beta, drops it down to alpha? Pictures, images. If you stop talking and just start visualizing walking on a beach or spending time with your children and no internal commentary, no internal dialogue, just a picture of a tree or a picture of your favorite cabin or a picture of it, your mind automatically drops the gear. And you can't drop into theta, which is sleeping, from theta. you got to go alpha. So if you're ever in a situation where you're like, God, i got to sleep, regulate your breath. Inhale for seven seconds, exhale for seven seconds. Count your breath, you know, like at first. Then calm yourself down, find that rhythm, stop counting, no numbers, no words, and start visualizing. What do I do? I go through all my forms at night. When I can't sleep mentally, I'm sitting there on the beach going through all my stuff, and I'm done. I never even finish a form. I just boop, down. So these are just knowing if you simply knew your body and knew what was going on with your big old puffy brain and all this you know, stress hormones being dumped by it, you'd stop tormenting yourself. So that's what I mean by we all grow old, but we don't grow up. No one was given the manual. No one was really given any real direction on the actual nature of reality or your body. You're just raised to be a consumer. That's what you do. Go get an education, get a job, get married, get a house, get some kids, raise the kids, retire. That's you. That is not human existence. That's a necessary part of the mundane. <clears throat> Just like using the restroom, you have to. But that's not existence. Existence is being. Existence is actually being here now. You have to do all of those things so you have a little sanctuary. But the very purpose of our life got turned into being a consumer, which is all stress. So let's say that your higher nature is blocked by the stress of being another reason why men die first. But uh, it's just the way it is. So there's actual techniques in which we can turn off incessive internal dialogue, clear the forehead screen, if you will, drop into the lower brain wave, <clears throat> and basically start to release the, you know, growth hormones. And the human body doesn't have to go through. You can be active, 
you can enjoy life, you can go through, you know, the whole process and not spend the last 20 years dying. But if you don't have the method, you're just going to do what got you there. And then that creates a lot of unnecessary suffering. And so I see it all the time, you know, and I see how people, especially in this community, reverse their biological age. It's astonishing the stuff these people can do, which is good for me because I'm like, okay, wait a minute. These people destroyed themselves for 67 years, walked in, and after two years, you're doing pretty good. I've been doing this for 35. I'm assuming, you know what I mean, I probably pretty, do pretty good at 72 or whatever. So it's really encouraging for me to see. My teacher would always say, you're taking a pill for a disease you won't get tomorrow. But when you're 18, 17, and 23, it's hard to believe any of that because you're going to be young forever. And not until you get to a certain age, especially after 50, the room changes and your peers change, you know? So it's like, okay, your most valuable possession is you. It sounds selfish, but it's actually selfless. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to take from others, give to yourself first. You know, that's responsibility. It's a circle, no beginning, no end. You're here. It's not at the beginning or the end of the circle. You're just in the circle. But you got to realize you come first so you can put yourself last and not take. Real simple. Guess what? Your new part-time job is you. That's your part-time job. You worked. You made your nest. Now you're in your nest. Now what? <laughs> you got to take care of yourself. And so, and you keep learning and growing. They say one of the most powerful things you can do is keep learning. It, because evolution rewards the species. If the species acquires information, then you get a little drop of dopamine. You know what happiness is? Happiness isn't in people, places, or things. Happiness is in growth. I had a hard time with that when I was taught that. True happiness comes from the sense of growing. When you learn something, when you expand, and that's what you can uh, you know, share with others. So from what I see in my daily life, there's no reason to walk around like this. There's none. But if you lose your body, what they call that is a separation of hun and po. A lot of times what happens is, guess what? We're not strong enough to live or brave enough to die. So then you become a zombie. You're basically in a medicated stupor. And it's a crime for not only you, but for society. And our population, guess what? It's, it's going to be the majority of a bunch of old people standing on line waiting for their meds with their orthopedic shoes in their mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> right? And you know what? <laughs> Society's not too happy about it. You know, your little millennials aren't too excited about feeding you. Right? They're like, you know what? Yeah, they had their time. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just saying. So you have to say, guess what? You know, it's not how long I live, it's how well I live. Live every day until I die. And basically be active every single day. Mentally learn something. Emotionally experience something. Physically do something. Those are the three treasures, mind, body, and heart, you know? And if you can do that, then you'll get the little bump, and you'll get this growth. Okay, we've got a couple minutes. Questions? <clears throat> yes, ma'am? What did your old teacher die from? I don't know. He heart, just left. You know what? I'm going to be honest with you. The only thing that keeps us here, if you want to get really, really philosophic, is addiction. Yeah, especially if you're not afraid of dying. And this guy, from what I've seen, you know, the way he lived and what he was through, he wasn't scared of dying. And it's at a certain point, you go through it, you go through it. You know, they say you polish the soul with the sword. In other words, consciousness evolves by doing time and form. So that piece of I am, have you ever noticed it's always been you and it's always been now? You look in the mirror and say, holy crap. I'm 50. I look like crap. You know, you think you're a sexy 18-year-old and you're not? Ah, it's like the old dude snuck up on me. So, but it's but in here you're still the you're still you. So that's you. So the yin and yang, these two things, that's the only part that's truly you. The little dots. The rest is rotting flesh. And you know what he did? He probably just stopped his breathing. Probably. And so, probably, that's what they used to do. And so they lengthen, 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 and they're out. But uh, who cares? Who cares? But the point is, at a certain point, is you've done it. 
You've earned it. You've been through it. You have it. I'm done. I've seen it happen a few times now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we know the importance of keeping the mind active and learning. Yes. And you go to take a class and you sit, sit yes. hours. Yes. Right. And then all that information gets into your old noggin right. and floats around. How do you reconcile that with? Yeah. Great question. That's why. What are we learning? We're learning us. We're not learning. Right now, this is a silly lecture, but it's not. It's all right. We're standing. Our feet are shoulder width apart. Our knees are over our heels. Oh, tailbone over the shoulders. It's learning about you as you move. Biggest way. So you've got to learn you. you got to live physically establish a relationship with your body. But otherwise, we call that collecting maps. You know about something, but you never went there. There's knowledge, not wisdom. Cookbook. So you don't, it's not just about learning. It's about experiencing and applying that knowledge to reality. Knowledge is nothing unless it's applied to reality. Big piece. Good question. Yes. How does this work if you have arthritis? Horribly. We can't help you. <laughs> Next. No. Uh, so, yeah, yes. so, again, what type? Osteo, right? Or rheumatoid. Yeah. So, first step, uh, you Google it, you must move. They already know that. Yeah. Right? That's Western science already knows right. that. So, well, we are saying, yeah, you must move. But not only must you move, but we must move in a very specific manner, and we must really assist the breakdown of the calcium deposits on the bones, which again is highly acidic lymphatic fluid. So you got to really get in there. Yes. All these times when Western medicine is necessary. Absolutely, Western medicine. So some of my best. Has anybody ever heard of Core Institute? The guy that owns that is one of my best friends, David, and he's a genius. He's a wizard. He's truly a wizard. All right, here's the time. It's New Year's Eve. Where's Dave? He's not at the house. He invites us to his house for a party. He shows up an hour late, covered in blood. Dave, what happened? Massive car accident. He had to do an emergency tracheotomy on, on some woman who was dying in front of him. He just did 18 hours of surgery, and he saved her life right there with a pocket knife. and a, You know what I mean? He was the dude. Then they came home and had a drink. And so Western medicine really did good. Western medicine is best for trauma. Trauma. Yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, at last resort, guess what? Sometimes it's the only thing keeping you alive, and I do understand that. And we have to be very realistic and can't say, well, no, I'm going to eat the eye of a goat, and I'm going to be okay. You probably won't be. If So we have to be very realistic. First and foremost, Western medicine, there's no place better in the world to be shot or hit by a bus <laughs> than right here. Right, so, so that's, right. That, that's just the truth. There, there, there's a good chance too, but because they are, they're, they're wizards. They're definitely wizards. So Western medicine is best for trauma. Next, Western medicine is best for diagnosis. Yes. You cannot. I can do pulse diagnosis. You know, screw that. Go get an MRI. Yeah, you know, your mother didn't love you, and it's starting to show up. No, get an MRI. I'm very realistic. Nothing better than diagnosis. The, the technology is astonishing. So we can't discount. So I'm not that guy who says, you know, everything's all natural and we're just going to, you'll die. So it's a balance in your own mind. It's got to use Western and traditional and bring them in. If I just go with traditional views, then guess what? I'm a limited caveman. If I just go with a Western view, guess what? I'm a profit center for big pharma. So either way, I lose. So the yin yang mind, which is a pain in the ass, we want to be black or white. But this thing doesn't look like this. You do know this. It's actually a big thing of mercury. It's gray, and it's spinning. The lazy mind wants it right or wrong. It's not. It's a constant balance. So Western medicine, we never lived in a better time. And just get ready for what they can do. Look at what they're doing with uh, stem cells. Look at what they're doing with, uh, they already have a pill that can reduce your biological age and keep you at about 50, <laughs> infinitely. It'll cost you $10 a day. I'm serious. I research all this stuff. But now we're looking at the implications. And what is it going to do? Unintended consequences. You know, what is it going to do to the medical industry? What is it going to do to retirement? What is it going to do to pensions? What is, but they're figuring out, guess what? If I can get you back to 50, sir, guess what you're going to do? Okay. No more Social Security, and your ass is going to work. <laughs> That's what I'm 107. I know. See you, later. you know, because you're biologically 50. 
So that's a whole other thing. What's so, up, girl? Pardon me? What's up, girl? That's right. That's right. He's back. Yes. Oh, okay. The different types of Qigong, medical Qigong. Do you know there's a three types of Qigong, right? No. Yeah. Martial, medical, and spiritual. So martial Qigong is the first thing I was taught. So using energy. So to become like a, a first degree, I had to break 108 rocks this big with my hand. One at a time. <clears throat> Boom, and they just split, you know? And that's using iron shirt training, making the hand. If you can break a rock, you can break any bone in the human body. Good. So you show up to the fight with two hammers. And then you learn how to, when you get hit, you exhale, you wrap all the organs. Hollow organs collapse, solid organs split. But if I can do iron shirt, you punch me, you won't knock me out. So that's all martial Qigong. And they use Qigong to make them great fighters. Okay? That's martial Qigong, Kung Fu. You've seen it, right? And that was a prerequisite of my education because then it's real. If you know Qigong, I should be able to break this two by four on your back. Okay. Just let me know you're about to do it. And so, okay, that's how Houdini died. They didn't let him know. And so, uh, right, because he would just exhale and stabilize his organs. Medical Qigong is learning how to do movements specifically to affect the different hollow and solid organs and joints, and it's built on the traditional Chinese medicine stuff. Spiritual Qigong is about how to reverse aging and illuminate the golden court, meaning you sit and you meditate to the point where you drop into this moment of pure silence. The moment of pure silence is when you're introduced to what they call the very nature of your mind, where there's no internal dialogue, just an observer. There's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no ears, there's no taste, and there's no feelings. You got rid of everything, but you're still alive. Spiritual Qigong is practicing being conscious after death because you basically die and you practice being dead. You slow your heart rate, you slow, you get rid of your breath. Everything is turned off, but you're not dead. You don't need eyes to see. So you practice, oh wow, I'm not my senses. The senses are basically facilitating my experience. I am that which is having it. Let's practice not being in our body so that when I drop dead, I don't freak out. And I'm used to it because if I freak out, I'll go back to another body. So it's a whole heavy thing. So there's three. Marshall is the first thing I was taught. Medical. My teacher said, you know, you must be strong. A man, you know, serves Kuan Yin. So their argument is a man's job is to die first. So if the feminine, meaning the elderly women or children, are in peril, the first one to stand up and die should be the young man because he has to run in with the sword and serve the society. Okay, and that's honorable. Then there's, okay, next step is you need to learn how to take care of the elderly. You need to learn how to fix stuff. So that's a medical qigong. Okay, then you need to learn how to become one with the moment, the spiritual qigong. So those are the three. Okay, what we do here is uh, all martial, all sword fighting. Okay. Yeah. It's all, it's all <laughs> yeah, that's great stuff. Jedi is one of the biggest secular religions. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. The force is huge. But anyways, it's basically uh, Bushido code. Any other questions? Did you learn anything new? Yes. yes. Okay. If applied to your life, will it improve its quality? Yes. yes. All right. And that's a big piece of uh, my cave. So, so I go to bed, and then someone today got something that removed their suffering. So who do you want to be? The guy that went to bed and created suffering, or the guy that went to bed and removed suffering? Which one's easier to drop into a sound sleep? You see, so it's really very selfish of me. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody showing, yes? Oh, no, you're finished. Okay, I appreciate everybody showing up.